A happy new year to you all, and with a new year comes new mad lads. So, let's start off strong. 2021 may have been a rough year for all of us, but 2008 was arguably even rougher. Millions of people were tricked into making totally safe investments that were actually based on nothing, until the bubble burst and ruined the stock market, costing many people their pensions and their homes. It was a horrifically unique demonstration of greed and man's ability to screw over his neighbour. And it's happened before. As you all know, nothing is stronger than the bond between a certain people and their money. And there are those among them who would do anything for that paper, such as meddling in a financial crisis from their illegitimate country. That's right, today's mad lad is a Scotsman. Gregor McGregor. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the mad lad, a big thank you to Raycon for sponsoring this video. With over 40,000 five star reviews, Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel and sound better than ever, matching the quality of other premium audio brands while starting at only half the price. Raycons offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life and they will stay in your ears for the entire time. Not only do the optimised gel tips make that perfect in-ear fit very comfortable, but they will not move, regardless of the shape and size of your ears. And as I enter the new year, I plan to make production on the channel bigger and better than ever and my Raycons help me get into the zone as I commute to the studio. And if you want to grab your own quality earbuds while supporting my channel, you can click on the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get 15% off your order. Gregor McGregor, the man so nice they named him twice, was born on the 24th of December 1786 in Stirlingshire. His dad, Daniel McGregor, was a sea captain in the East India Company, so the little lad had plenty of tea to keep him warm until Daniel died when Gregor was four. But Gregor managed to survive childhood thanks to the grit that he inherited from his Jacobite ancestors, which allegedly included the legendary Rob Roy. Gregor also claimed to be descended from one of the settlers of Scotland's disastrous attempt to colonise the Isthmus of Panama. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. As a teenager, Gregor reportedly studied at Edinburgh University for a couple of years before dropping out. But unlike most college dropouts, he had a plan. With Jacobite blood coursing through his veins, Gregor heard the call of adventure and, like a good mad lad, he answered. In April of 1803, at the tender age of 16, although he looked closer to 12, Gregor joined the British Army, and to help him get started in his new career, his family gave him a little coming-of-age present. A commission in the 57th Regiment of Foot. That's right, Mummy paid for him to skip the queue and become an officer right away. But despite having bought his way up to the rank of unsign, he didn't have to shell out any cash for his promotion to lieutenant the following February. At the youngest possible age for enlistment, Gregor had joined the army just in time for the Napoleonic Wars, and he was ready and raring to go to kick some French arse in 
Guernsey. Gregor was sent to the Channel Island of Guernsey to protect it from the French. Now, this sounds like a great opportunity. He would get to fortify the island, maybe seven samurai the locals into fight and shape, and when the invasion comes, he could mount a valiant defence and get his name in the history books as the hero that told that little snail slurp and manlet to fuck off. However, <laughs> there, was, there was just one problem. The, the invasion never came. After all, why would it? Who the fuck wants Guernsey? So yeah, Gregor started his career by just sitting on his arse for a few months until his regiment was moved to Gibraltar. But on the bright side, he did meet an admiral's daughter named Maria Bowater, whom he married in June of 1805. However, her family, which included generals and MPs, were not particularly happy about this marriage because Maria was way out of Gregor's league. You see, Maria had a fantastic set of assets and Gregor was beyond delighted when he saw her absolutely massive dowry. Point being, Maria and her family were extremely wealthy, and Gregor and his family were complete commoners in comparison, hence why they were very unhappy about the marriage. However, Gregor immediately put this money to good use by buying the rank of captain so that he didn't have to earn it by doing some actual work for a few years. Gregor really enjoyed being a captain and he became obsessed with status, titles and all that other snobbish bullshit. It even got so bad that his men got really pissed off with him because he wouldn't allow them to leave their quarters if they weren't wearing full dress uniform. In Gibraltar weather. So yeah, fuck that guy. As a Scot, he should know better. But while he enjoyed all the pageantry of his new rank, Gregor clearly wasn't a big fan of the responsibility that came along with it, as he basically spent his entire time in Gibraltar the same way he spent his last assignment, by sitting around and doing absolutely nothing. Well... Nothing except for arguing with his superiors over absolutely petty bullshit. So, his superiors got very annoyed and promptly got rid of Gregor by having him seconded to the Portuguese army as a major in October of 1809. And Gregor only lasted there for six months. Gregor kept pissing off everyone around him until eventually he went, fuck this, and requested a discharge the following April, and his superiors couldn't sign it fast enough. On the 24th of May, 1810, Gregor made his official exit from the army and went home. But despite the manner of this exit, Gregor very often took credit for the brave deeds that earned his regiment its nickname, the diehards. Deeds which took place a year after Gregor left, so he actually had nothing to do with them. Upon his return to Britain, Gregor started telling everyone that he had been knighted for his service, which is very strange considering that he barely served. So why would that result in a knighthood? Well, it didn't. He completely made it up. You no doubt are starting to notice a certain trait in this man's character. Complete bullshit merchant. This man lied all the fucking time. But when he claimed he had been knighted, no one actually questioned him on it. However, the main flaw in the plan was that no one in Scotland gave a shit about the hoity-toity backwards pageantry of this fucking dickhead. You see, Scotland and the royal family were, you know, they were 
they were not on the best terms at this point in history, so no one really gave a shit about Gregor's fake knighthood. So, the clout chaser quickly got bored of no one caring, and he moved to London in 1811 to try and slide into their high society, where Gregor introduced himself as Sir Gregor. And he also told all of them that he was the chief of Clan MacGregor. This, of course, was a complete fucking lie. But Londoners knew pretty much nothing of Scottish culture, so they just believed him. Gregor was quickly learning that just flat out lying about everything opened a lot of doors. Gregor had a great time schmoozing with his fellow pretentious wankers in London, while his father-in-law paid for it all. But, unfortunately, you can't milk a cash cow forever. And in December of 1811, Gregor's wife Maria passed away, taking Gregor's access to her money and connections with her. Gregor was heartbroken by the loss of what he held dearest. His lifestyle, which he couldn't maintain because finding another hole he could gold dig isn't a good look in polite society. As a military man, the only real option for getting a job was going back to the army with his tail between his legs, which he didn't want to do for obvious reasons. Also, he didn't want to go home to Scotland because that would just simply be too boring. But luckily, another option soon emerged. South America had decided to boogaloo. So, Gregor hopped on a boat and arrived in Venezuela in April of 1812, seeking some war stories to make him a celebrity back home. And of course, if he didn't find any war stories, he would just go home and make some up. Armed with his fake knighthood and former position in a regiment that didn't become legendary until after he left it, Gregor just rocked up to the Venezuelan revolutionary General Francisco de Miranda and was immediately given a cavalry battalion and the rank of colonel. He then worked his way up to General of Division in the Army of Venezuela and New Granada. And on the 10th of June, Gregor married Simon Bolivar's cousin, Josefa Antonia Lovera. This man just bullshit his way all the way right up to the top. However, it couldn't last forever. A month later, the Spanish defeated the Republicans and captured General Miranda causing Gregor to flee, because everything this man touches just turns to shit. In 1813, Gregor joined the New Granada Army and was posted to a small border town where he sat in his arse and missed Simon Bolivar's successful campaign to create the Second Venezuelan Republic. The Republic, however, fell soon after and Bolivar went into exile and Gregor was now trapped in the city of Cartagena in Colombia, as it was being besieged by the Spanish. Until Gregor led an escape on the 5th of December 1815 by blasting through the blockade in gunboats. After escaping from Cartagena, Gregor met up with Bolivar in Haiti and hatched a plan to sneak into the coastal region of Okumare and incite some uprisings. But because the CIA wouldn't be established until 131 years later, the plan failed and Gregor and his 600 men were stuck behind enemy lines after Bolivar fled. Short on supplies, surrounded by swamps, and 300 kilometres away from the nearest friendly stronghold, Gregor finally put on his big boy pants and made himself useful. He courageously led his men as they fought their way through Spanish territory, using the terrain to his advantage by luring the Spaniards into the swamps and then taking them out with the help 
of native archers while they were bogged down. After a month of fighting through the worst expedition of all time, Gregor made it to friendly territory and word of his deeds spread. He was now a hero. Bolivar even congratulated Gregor by saying, and I quote, The retreat which you had the honour to conduct is, in my opinion, superior to the conquest of an empire. Please accept my congratulations for the prodigious services you have rendered my country. Now, that is very high praise coming from someone like Simon Bolivar, but Gregor wouldn't have had to have even done the retreat in the first place if Bolivar hadn't abandoned him. Bolivar also awarded Gregor with the Order of Libertadores for his bravery, but I like to think that this was just a way to make it up to Gregor. It was at this point where it seemed like Gregor was finally getting his shit together. After so many years of doing fuck all, Gregor finally appeared to have hit his stride as a soldier and adventurer, and men were lining up to serve with the famous general Sir Gregor MacGregor. And he now also had some real achievements under his belt, and not ones that he had made up. So, where did Gregor go next after becoming a bona fide war hero? Well, he became the first Florida man. No, no, really. Gregor hired 150 War of 1812 veterans, musketeers and mercenaries from Charleston and Savannah to invade Florida, which was still owned by the Spanish at this time, and he promised all of his men large estates in the future Sunshine State that he didn't actually own. But don't worry, he will, once he's conquered it all. In June of 1817, Gregor and the boys set off from Pennsylvania and assaulted Fort San Carlos on Amelia Island, which was only guarded by around 50 men. Using spies within the garrison, Gregor convinced the commander that he was coming with a force of over 1,000 men, which Gregor made convincing by having his men advance in groups from several directions. The Spaniards didn't even put up a fight, and Gregor raised his own flag over the island, proclaiming the Republic of the Floridas. This was a great start. One fort down, many more to go. Until Gregor went, nah, put his feet up and started drinking. Naturally, his men were kind of pissed off because they really wanted to keep the momentum going and also to be paid in something other than fake Amelia dollars. And then finally, on the 3rd of September, 1817, after not even bothering to set up defences for a Spanish counterattack, Gregor just <laughs> fucked off with the ship. <laughs> like, like, seriously, his men turned around and noticed that he was gone, and so was the ship. <laughs> Gregor just left his men to die when the Spanish inevitably came back to take the fort. Now, the whole invasion of Florida thing sounds like a complete failure on paper. And, and, and it was. It was an absolute fucking shambles. But it worked out great for Gregor. He basically got an epic holiday out of it. So, he did it again. From Florida, Gregor went back to Britain, borrowed £1,000, which was a huge chunk of money back then, and then hired more mercenaries to take Portobello in Panama, where he once again just fucked around for a while and then just bailed. Then, after some detours in San Andres and Haiti, Gregor set his sights on Rio de la Hacha in New Granada. And he did the exact same thing again. Hire mercs, take port, take credit, don't prepare defences, get drunk with the crew, refuse to elaborate further, leave. While Gregor undoubtedly had loads of fun during his little adventures, 
His actions were not without consequences. Bolivar was fucking pissed. In October of 1819, Bolivar declared Gregor a traitor and ordered every Venezuelan to kill Gregor on sight. So naturally, Gregor hauled arse out of there. The following April, Gregor found himself on the Mosquito Coast on the Gulf of Honduras where he met a tribal leader named George Frederick Augustus, whom Gregor called the Mosquito King. And they bonded over their mutual dislike of the Spanish. Naturally, they got drunk together, and Gregor emerged from the bender that he couldn't even remember, holding a deed for 8 million acres of mosquito land. In return for this piece of land that was bigger than Wales, Gregor had given the Mosquito King jewellery and rum. But now that all of the swashbuckling adventure shit is out of the way, it's time to get serious. Let's talk business. By this point in 1820, the Latinos had gained independence from Spain, and investors in London absolutely aped into South America, making money hand over fist. To make the deal even sweeter, Colombia issued a £2 million 20-year bond with a 6% interest rate, and the hype increased even further as a ton of investors started making a killing off of it. Other governments such as Chile and Peru soon followed suit, and also stonks in Latin American mining companies went absolutely nuclear. The market was more bullish than ever. Like, seriously, like, in South America during this time, it was mental. Picture times a thousand gains in the space of, like, two weeks. Stuff was absolutely nuclear. And investors were riding that bull all the way to the bank. Then, investments in South America began to diversify as people stopped looking too closely at exactly what they were pouring their money into. After all, why shouldn't they? It's South America. Do you not see how much money is to be made in there? It's such a good investment. Low risk, high reward. Never mind the moon. This shit is going all the way up your anus. So get on that Sigma grind set and ready those diamond hands, boys. We are going to be rich. Do you see where this is going yet? Do you see? Let me, let me, let me give you a little hint. These events later became known as the Latin American bubble of the 1820s. Now enter our boy Gregor, who saw all of this happening and wanted a piece of the action. So he made his own investment plan and put his new land to good use by claiming it as its own country. In 1821, Gregor made his triumphant return to Britain as... His Serene Highness Gregor MacGregor, the first sovereign prince of the state of Poye and its dependencies, and Kazik of the Poye nation. Kazik basically means native chief, so Gregor had essentially called himself a prince twice. But what is this new country that Gregor was in charge of? Well, that is exactly the question that Gregor returned to his homeland to answer. To put it simply, Poye is one of the new countries that emerged from the Spanish getting yeeted out of South America. And god damn is it a paradise. Poye, Poye is absolutely beautiful. The land is so fertile that it can grow anything. It can even support three harvests a year. The rivers are full of gold just waiting to be mined. And the place is teeming with fish and wildlife. Anyone who lives here would want for nothing. Their pantry would never empty. And they can easily buy anything that they can't produce themselves. And the weather, oh my god, the weather... Absolutely stunning. You would be mad not to move to Poye. But not only is this paradise ready for the taking, 
it was all already fully up and running. You see, Gregor has been very busy and he's established a capital city with all of the amenities that you could possibly need, including a bank, hospitals, schools, and even mansions. Mansions! You could go to Poye and live in a mansion. And best of all, Poye was friendly to Britain because... It hadn't really existed long enough for either of the nations to develop problems with each other. And Gregor was generous enough to share all of this with his fellow Scots to help them escape from the frigid wasteland that they call home. He established offices in London, Glasgow and Edinburgh and got all of the paperwork sorted. He did newspaper interviews and he even created a guidebook. Gregor did everything he could to spread the word of Poye, and his call was answered very quickly. Gregor's tale spread all across Scotland, and the adventurous Highlander spirit was awakened among his people. Invigorated by the prospect of riches and challenges that would be in this brave new world, hardy Scots from all over put their money where their mouths were and they came out in droves to grab a piece of the action for the low, low price of a shilling an acre. I mean, a shilling an acre, like, back then, that's that was an absolute bargain. That is practically giving land away. Gregor also helped settlers convert their pound sterling into poye dollars, and he also sold commissions in the poye army. Poye even followed the example of other South American countries and offered 30-year bonds at 3% interest. Business was booming and finally on the 10th of September 1822, it was time. 70 excited settlers, including doctors, lawyers, farmers, artisans and bankers, set sail for their new home, with Gregor himself seeing them off at the port. On the 22nd of January 1823, the second ship departed from Leith. Gregor himself boarded the ship to see off these 200 intrepid adventurers before being rowed back to shore as the crowd cheered. The flag of Poye was hoisted on the ship's mast and headed for the promised land. Two months later, they arrived and were greeted at the beach by the first 70 settlers who were, for some reason, very, very confused. You see, they couldn't find this El Dorado-esque wonderland anywhere. The settlers even had the ship sail up and down the Mosquito Coast trying to find it. But all they could see was a wasteland. As far as the eye can see, there was nothing but jungle and the most unfarmable land you've ever seen. Where were the bustling towns? Where were the hospitals, the schools, the farms? Where were the gold mines? Where were the people? Where was Poye? It wasn't real. We made it all up. It was a complete work of fiction. It's not true. An outright fabrication. It's not real. It's a complete work of fiction. It's just simply not true. This one was invented by an arsehole. There was no Poye. No such country existed. There were no towns, no banks, no schools, no people, no resources, no country, nothing. Gregor made the entire thing up to swindle these people out of their life savings. All there was, was a bunch of unusable, worthless land with nothing on it that Gregor had been given by a drunk chieftain. However, before the settlers could cut their losses and go home, the rainy season began, and a hurricane wrecked their ships, stranding them and destroying their supplies. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, the settlers learned why the Mosquito Coast was called the Mosquito Coast. Turns out there's a shit ton of mosquitoes. I mean, I know. I was surprised too. Uh, and all the mosquitoes ended up coming out because of the monsoon. And they gave all of the colonists yellow fever and malaria. 
The tropical diseases and exposure to the elements were so bad that two-thirds of the settlers basically, literally, shit themselves to death one by one. Still better than Leith. In May of 1823, an embassy ship from British Honduras noticed the remaining settlers and gave them a lift to Belize. And you know that you're fucked whenever Belize is your sanctuary. And the experience was so bad that some of them even just decided to stay there. Of the 270 settlers that set out for a new life in Poirier, only around 50 returned. But they weren't the only ones that were burned by Gregor's scam. Remember the Latin American bubble that I mentioned earlier? Well, it burst in 1825. And one of the main reasons for it busting was Gregor's scam. Yes, that's right, Gregor crashed the fucking economy. <laughs> you fucking dickhead. Uh, yes, uh, Gregor helped to crash the fucking economy. And the fallout from this was so bad that 12 banks in Britain ended up closing. And not even Gregor himself was unaffected. Gregor made around £200,000 in cash, but the value of the bonds he issued were worth around £1.3 million. Adjusted for fear ruining everything, Gregor was worth around £3.6 billion until the economy crashed and the shares in Poirier became worthless. But still, no British person would concoct a bigger scam until the NHS was founded a century later. Imagine being able to manipulate so many people on that kind of scale. This absolute bastard sweet-talked and took advantage of the pride of a culture to manipulate people into sailing west to a totally amazing promised land which caused only ruin and death for those that went. And then the collapse of their homeland and the South American economy which had a knock-on effect and caused a global recession. There was just no way in hell that Gregor could get away with something like this. So... What happened to him? Nothing. No, nothing happened to him. Abs absolutely nothing. Uh, he had swindled everyone so fucking well that he managed to twist things into making people believe that he was also a victim. Gregor got people to believe that he had been duped by his advisors and publicists. Actual victims who had lost multiple family members even defended Gregor against any accusations of wrongdoing and they also signed a declaration saying that if Gregor had been on the ship with them, the journey wouldn't have gone wrong. The man stole massive amounts of money, got hundreds of people killed, put all of the blame on other people and then had the audacity to paint himself as the man to save the day and make his victims thank him for it. <laughs> look, it, look, it looks like maxing out the speech attribute pays off. But before anyone could figure out who was really at fault for the whole debacle, Gregor moved to France in 1825. And then he tried to do it again. <laughs> He fucking, he fucking tried to do it again. He tried to do the exact same thing again, except this time with French people. Same bullshit story about this paradise with bustling towns and rivers and fucking bucks and wenches that shit gold. All that bullshit. He did all of that bullshit again, but in France, so that he could con even more people out of their life savings. However, the scheme didn't work this time, because the... French authorities noticed that a lot of people seemed to have these shiny new passports for a place that they'd never heard of. So they seized the ship before it could set sail so that they could conduct an investigation. Gregor and some of his associates were then later arrested. Now, 
it's blindingly obvious who was at fault here. And with Gregor's track record of swindling hundreds of people out of their life savings and then leaving them to die, which many of them did, and then crashing the fucking economy, surely there was no way that he'd avoid justice. I'm laughing, can you guess? He was acquitted. He was fucking acquitted. So, after his release, Gregor returned to Britain in 1826 with no fanfare. And the cheeky bastard continued with modified versions of the Poyet scheme. Although, he never saw anywhere near as much success as the initial run because people were now being much more careful with their money. After all... There was a recession. And, to make matters even worse, Gregor was also being undercut by the Mosquito King's successor, who was selling Gregor's land to lumber companies. And people that had bought bonds in Poyer were now angrily knocking on Gregor's door, demanding the interest that Gregor had promised them. Gregor finally stopped the Poyer scheme in 1837 and all of his bullshit had finally caught up with him. He was extremely deep in debt and everyone and their mum was out to get him. Finally, Gregor would have to face the consequences of his actions. Or so you'd think. In October of 1838, after his second wife died, Gregor did what any criminal does when backed against a wall. He fled to South America. Now, I know what you're thinking. Going back to Venezuela was an extremely stupid idea. After all, Bolivar had made it abundantly clear that he was a dead man if he returned. So, Gregor was fucked. At long last, it was time for him to bite the bullet. Until he received a hero's welcome when he arrived. Bolivar had been dead and disgraced for eight years by this point, and the Venezuelans didn't know anything about the dodgy bullshit that Gregor had been up to in Europe. So... The bastard was immediately recognised as one of the country's liberators. He was hooked up with a citizenship and general's pension and lived happily ever after until the 4th of December 1845 when he passed away at the age of 58 and buried with full military honours in Caracas Cathedral. The cheeky... Bastard. Now, I don't think that I need to point out that Gregor doesn't exactly have the best legacy. Not just because of the fact that he was a massive dickhead that just couldn't stop getting away with it, but also because he committed some truly heinous acts. The worst of these, in my opinion, was taking advantage of his own countrymen as their shared kinship made them more trusting of him and therefore easier for him to manipulate. But you cannot deny how ingenious his Poye scheme was. No stone was left unturned in making the scam appear legitimate, and some have even dubbed Gregor McGregor as the father of securities fraud. But he was still responsible for the deaths of around 500 people through the Poye scam and also his prior raiding holidays across the Caribbean, all while scamming them all out of their life savings and then crashing the fucking economy. So, you know, I respect the hustle, but the man's a piece of shit. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!